All right, guys. Hey, hey, let me uh, let me welcome you to worship like the rest of our leaders have done tonight. Just so glad that you're with us this evening. Hey, as you make your way back to your seats, um, we're going to be in Acts 17, so you can go ahead and grab your copy of God's Word and flip over there. And we're going to start off with a little game tonight that I call Questions You Don't Have a Chance of Answering Correctly. Who's ready to play? Um, okay, all right, here we go, here we go. All right, so take a look at the screen right here. This is a picture of the Hong Kong skyline at night. It's gorgeous, beautiful. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, okay, Sam, I, you know, I of all the people here, I figured you would be the one guy who had been there. Um, okay, here we go. Question number one. How many skyscrapers, how many skyscrapers are in the city of Hong Kong? Okay, all right, 200. Not even close. Not even halfway there. All right. 500. Okay. Pretty close. 546 skyscrapers. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? All right. Uh, question number two that you're not going to get right. Take a look at the screen. How many traffic lights are in New York City? Just in the five boroughs, how many traffic lights are in? 5,000. <laughs> 5, too many. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. Too many. All right. Anybody got a number? Ooh. 12,000, that's actually close. 13,543. And Gary, that's why New Yorkers are so patient and kind and tolerant and sweet-tempered, okay? Right, exactly. Okay, last question, last question. Take a look at the screen. That's a picture of the Acropolis there in Greece. How many idols, how many figurines, how many false statue idols were in ancient Athens. How many false gods, how many idols, little figurines, statues, temples, whatever you want to say. Okay. I'll give you a hint. There were only 40,000 people in the city when Paul was there. Okay. Which we're going to be reading about in Acts 17 tonight. Who has, yeah, 10, you're not even close. 10,000 is not even close. One of the Greek historians tells us that there were 30,000 idols, 30,000 statues, 30,000 altars to, to gods and the pantheon of gods that plagued Greeks' culture or the Greco-Roman world. They're in Athens. In fact, Peteronius, one of the Greek historians, tells us that it was, quote, easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man. Now, Athens, like, what do you think about? What do you think about when, when, we, when we say Athens? Like, just shout out what you, what you think about. Yeah, like Greece, okay. F okay philosophy, I exactly. Um, what's that? Athens, Tennessee. <laughs> okay. All right, so my friend over here is a little geographically uh, challenged, but yes, there's an Athens in Tennessee. Um, what else? I mean, can I just say, I think toga robes, um, uh, toga parties. I, I think little little uh, leaf braids around a person's head, right? I mean, all these things. So, so this is Athens, right? I mean, I, I learned as a teenager, all I needed to know about Athens from Bill and Ted's, you know, excellent adventure um, when they went to... To, to kidnap Socrates or uh, Socrates. But that movie actually took place about 350 to 400 BC when Athens was in its heyday, okay? It had been the cultural center of Greece back then. But this is 50 to 55 AD. This is almost 400 years later, 300 to 400 years later. Athens has kind of become the second fiddle to a different city in Greece called Corinth. And we'll talk about that next week. But Athens, it had seen its better days. It was in decline. It was only 40,000 people living there when, when Paul visited on his journey that we're going to talk about here. It, it had come down from 250,000 people just 300 years earlier. So this city, unlike most cities, this growing, this one is shrinking, okay? So it's it's kind of seen its better day. Everybody's talking about Corinth now, not Athens. It's kind of like like nobody goes to Oxford anymore when you go to, to, to England. You, you go to London. Everything's in London. All the attractions are in London. Only the nerds go out to, you know, about an hour out of town to Oxford to see the university and the spires and all the cool nerd things there. Well, the same thing was true of Athens. 
Everybody came to Greece, went to Corinth. Only the nerds, the philosophers, those pondering their belly buttons would want to go to Athens. And you say that, why are we talking about this? Well, for number one reason, the story that we've been talking about this evening, Acts chapter 17, Paul is actually in Athens. He has ventured to Athens. And so let me show you where we are on the map. Okay, this first map here shows us where we were in Acts chapter 16, right? But um, he's come through, you know, modern day Turkey. He's gone to, through Lystra and Derby, all these places. He's, he's hit up. He's actually crossed over. Uh, last week, he crossed over in chapter 16 to Greece. The gospel has now gone to Europe. He's in Philippi. But what you're about to see is on this next map. There you go. On this next map right here, you see that he's going to make his way down through Thessalonica in the first part of chapter 17. He gets run out of town there, as we just, as we just talked about in our feedback session. He's also been in Berea run out of Berea by the same Jews who were in Thessalonica, and now he has sailed down to Athens. Now, that's the first reason we're talking about this, but there's a second reason we're talking about this, because Athens, as I've explained to you, is a city that is just dominated by idols, this false god, this pagan worship. And, and I just think that, well, there's another culture that means a lot to those of us in this room tonight. This also flooded with idols. I don't know. See if any of this looks familiar to you. Yeah, does this, look at the screen. Check that out. This uh, ring a bell here, the big fancy mansion, the flashy car, the, the cool jewelry, the stacks of cash, the food, the drugs, the alcohol, the, the, you know, the sex entertainment. I, I mean, oh, guys, if you've ever wondered if America has a problem with idolatry, we have a show on television. It's one of the most popular shows in reality TV's history called American Idol, okay? So that's why we're going to be talking about what Paul does and says in Athens because we are an idol-soaked culture just like they were. So let's see what Paul has to say here, okay? We're going to be in Acts 17, verse 16, okay? That's where we're going to pick it up. Acts 17, verse 16. This is what God's Word says. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, okay, he's, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy. He left them in Berea and sailed ahead. Remember from, from our discussion earlier. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took... Um, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athens and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul's basically hanging out there. We're going to pause here just for a second. Paul's hanging out in Athens, just waiting on Silas and Timothy, and he was just going to wait for them. But as he's walking around buying this Cuban sandwich and checking out the sites, he can't help but notice all of the idols, all of the idolatry, all the pagan rituals, all this, these temples that are set up there um, to, to honor the Roman gods, to honor the Greek gods, to, to honor any African gods that have been brought to their shores. Um, and so the Bible says that his spirit was provoked within him. The word that we translate that out of the Greek into the, into the English is paroxysm. It's, um, it's this, this deep emotional like outburst, like angry, like frustration. Like he just, he could not control himself. He wanted to wait for Silas and Timothy. But he just had this outburst of like, I, I can't hold back. I got to tell these people about Jesus. And so the Bible says that he went into a synagogue and there he reasoned because that's what he does, right? Paul is a Jew who's called to the Gentiles, but he always starts off in the synagogues first. And in the synagogues right there in Athens, he's talking about, let's look at verse 18, Jesus and the resurrection. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about Jesus and the resurrection. That's it. 
That's his topic. Paul is not letting the Stoic or Epicurean or any other philosopher set the pace of the conversation. He's not letting them set the tone. He's certainly not them letting them set the subject or the topic of the conversation, okay? He says, we're going to talk about Jesus and we're going to talk about the resurrection. And guys, I would just suggest to you that you do the same thing. You don't wait for the world around you to start talking about Jesus and the resurrection, okay? Don't. Here's why. Because just like in Athens, they would have never gotten around to that subject. They would have never gotten around to that topic. They would have never gotten onto the subject of Jesus and the resurrection. Firstly, because, well, they may, may have never heard of Jesus. And secondly, because of their response to Jesus that you're going to hear about in a few minutes. All right. So don't wait. Our world is never going to choose to talk about Jesus. And somebody, Root Church, needs to talk about Jesus. Maybe, I don't know, hypothetically, be a witness for Jesus since we are in Acts. Okay, listen, let me ask you a question. Could Paul have talked about philosophy? Could Paul have talked about law? Could, could Paul have talked about culture or politics? Absolutely. He could, have, he could have put them in the fetal position in the corner crying for their mommies, okay? But Paul didn't want to talk about any of those things. He wanted to talk about Jesus and want to talk about the resurrection. And I think that there's two reasons why. Number one, well, the Savior of Christianity, Jesus, makes us unique. You know, at Bible study on Wednesday night this week, I was talking to a young man, Josh. He's, he's not here this evening. He's new. He's and kind of coming out in our Bible study here of Acts 17. He says, you know, Pastor David, I'm, I'm doing this um, comparative religion studies. I'm comparing Christianity to all these other religions. I said, great. That's awesome. I really, really recommend you do that. But so, let me just go ahead and give you the answers. Let me just go ahead and show you the cheat sheet here, okay? Um, I know how this test ends. The biggest difference between Christianity and every other religion out there is this. Christianity offers a savior between God and man that no other religion offers. Don't believe me? Here, I'll take you to the Quran. We could talk about Allah. Allah says, you better straighten out your sin. You better, you better, you're not going to not have sin, but you better have more good deeds and you have bad deeds if you want to enter paradise with me. Yeah, well, raise your hands. Raise your hands if you're just really awesome. Here tonight, raise your hands if you're just really awesome at doing good things and avoiding sin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All of us stink at that. Okay, so good luck to our Muslim friends, right? Let's talk about Hinduism. They don't just have one God. They don't have two gods or three gods. They have 300 to 330 million gods. This one says that. That one says this. This one's the God over this. This one's the God over that. And there's sometimes there's overlap. Who do you choose to please, right? There's you and 300 million gods. Good luck pleasing all of them. We, we could talk about, you know, um, Buddhism. Like, there's not really a, a god in Buddhism because Buddha is not really a god. I don't know if you know that or not. But like there's an eightfold path and you got these noble truths. And, and again, it's, it boils down to, are you doing good? See, all of those things all of those religions, all of those ethics, all those ideologies, they all have one thing in common. Do good and don't do bad. Now, Christianity also says do righteous and avoid unrighteousness, but there's no salvation attached to that. In Christianity, God sends his son Jesus to die on a cross to pay for our sin because he knows that we cannot avoid sin perfectly like his son Jesus did. So if you want to know what makes Christianity unique, it's Jesus the Savior. That's why Paul's talking about him here in Athens. The Savior, Jesus, makes Christianity unique. But that wasn't what Paul was talking about, just Jesus. He was talking about Jesus and the resurrection. Let me tell you why he was talking about the resurrection. Because the resurrection, as a historical fact, makes Christianity true. Who, who cares what Jesus said? And who cares what, what Paul would have said about Jesus there in Athens? If Jesus' bones are decaying and rotting in some cave in the Middle East back there close to Jerusalem, who cares what Jesus stood for? Who cares what Jesus announced if he's dead? Because he's a liar. He said he was going to die and be raised. So if he didn't, if he wasn't raised, if he didn't rise from the dead, who cares what he has to say? But Paul says, no, no, no. He did say he was going to rise and he did 
rise. So that's why we've got to talk about Jesus. So Paul's in there in Athens talking about Jesus and the resurrection because Jesus the Savior makes us unique as Christians. And the resurrection it defines reality. It makes our faith true. Okay, it's the pinnacle event in scriptures. Okay, so that's what Paul's talking about. And before we keep going, let me just remind you of this line here that I closed with a moment ago. Verse 21, before we jump into 22. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there, they would spend their time in nothing new except telling or hearing something new. Um, they, they would just walk around pondering their belly buttons. They, they love to walk around the Acropolis and the Areopagus talking about the latest and greatest fad or politic or ideology, right? And so Paul, man, he's going, you want to hear something new? You want to hear something different? Let me tell you about Jesus and the resurrection. So let's pick it up here. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship, and I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What you therefore worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for, and Paul quotes here, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own prophets have said, and Paul quotes again, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or imagination of man. No, no, the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has been given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's talking about Jesus, obviously, right there. Now, verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Okay, so let me just kind of tell you where this story is taking place here. Take a look at the screen there, okay? Yeah, this is a city, this is a picture, kind of an elevated picture of modern day Athens. See that little yellow arrow there? It's pointing to that, that rocky hill. It's not the highest point in the city anymore. You can see that, right? But, but that, that hill there, that's the Areopagus, okay? The pictures I've been showing you tonight are, are the Acropolis, okay? This is the Areopagus. There's nothing there anymore. It's just a stone mountain hill inside the city limits of Athens, right? This is where Paul is standing. Guys, can you imagine? Look at that little... We don't exactly know the trails and the paths and the roads and the sea, the seafarers that, that Paul took on his journeys. But guys, we know that that little bitty tiny rock stone hill right there, the apostle Paul stood there and preached the gospel 2,000 years ago. Somewhere on that little tiny hill. Um, let me tell you why this little hill is important. Because 2,000 years ago, in Paul's day, Jesus' day, two things happened. There were temples erected there to the false gods, to the Greek gods, to the Roman gods. And they used those temples also to hold court. They would have a judge and they would hold court. They would hold trials. They would hold, hold these hearings there. So there was this, this Areopagus, or, or some of your translations actually may say, Mars Hill, same same place. Mars is the god there. Okay, um, they would they would either worship their gods, or they would hold court proceedings, trials. Okay, um, it was a, a place of judicial happenings. So I want you to to remember that. Okay, this is a very religious place. Okay. Um, the whole city is. In fact, as Paul's standing there in the Areopagus, he says, 
You know, men of Athens, I see that you're religious in every way. You've got a God for rain. You've got a God for the harvest. You've got a God for the sky. You've got a God for the day, the night, the underworld, the, the sea. The, you've got a God for, for uh, fertility. You've got a God for everything. In fact, you're so superstitious. You've got an altar set up over there that's dedicated to the unknown God. Just in case there's a God out there that you don't know of, you've never heard of, you've never worshipped, you've put him up or her up, a statue. And so just in case you ever bump into that God in the afterlife, you can say, no, 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 look, in my hometown, we built you an altar. We didn't know your name, but we built you an altar. This is to the altar to the unknown, unknown God. You talk about superstitious. Well, in my family, we're big fans of The Office, right? Michael Scott, I don't know if you've ever watched the show. Yeah, we got, okay, we got some fans here. Remember that scene where Michael Scott goes, he goes, you know, I'm not really superstitious. Um, I'm only like a little stitious. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Athenians were super superstitious, okay? They, they were trying to cover their basis. And so Paul introduces to them the one who they know as the unknown God. He goes, the one you worship as the unknown God, I know his name. His name is Jesus. And so Paul begins to talk about Jesus and the resurrection as we discussed. But I want to draw your attention to this magnificent, this beautiful, this hyper intelligent sermon that Paul preached. Just two quickly, uh, two points quickly. Paul talks about, did you catch this? Paul talks about Jesus as creator. Why does he do that? Right there in verse 24 and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He goes, look, you use Mars Hill, you use the Areopagus as a place to worship your the gods that you think created the world. Let me tell you about Jesus. He is the creator. He is the undisputed creator. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're talking about Jesus according to Colossians chapter 1, okay, guys? Like, this is what Paul's talking about. He goes, you see this place as a place to worship the creator? Let me tell you about the creator. Okay, you have a God in your hand. You have a God around your neck. You have a little God in your pocket. You whittled them out of stone. You, you carved them out of wood. You, you made them with your hands. How can, you, how can you see anything that you made as your God? That makes no sense. If he's God, he would make us. If you carved it, if you built, built it, if you chiseled it, if you erected it, I trust me, it's not a god, guys. It's an idol. And so Paul hits them right in the fields, right in their heads with, you come here to Areopagus, to Mars Hill, to worship the Creator, let me tell you his true identity. It's Jesus. But then, hold on. I want to remind you, they also use the Areopagus Mars Hill as a place to hold trials to do the business of judiciary courts, right? Let me take you back over here to verse 30. The times of ignorance God has overlooked, says Paul, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Talking about Jesus. So, they saw this hill as a place to worship the creator and to hold court. Paul is saying, I'm offering you Jesus for both. I'm offering you Jesus for both. He is the creator and he is the judge. He was there in the beginning. He's going to be there in the end on your judgment day. Give your lives to him. But when Paul started talking about the resurrection... That's when the Athenians checked out. That's when they said, nope, we're done. We've had enough. In fact, let me just remind you here as we close, the last verse I read to you, verse 32 and 33, even 34, it says, but when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. So as you sit here tonight, listen, that's, that is absolutely an option that you have at your disposal. As I'm preaching about Jesus the way Paul preached about Jesus that day in Athens, you can sit here and listen to me and say, David, I, I just think you're crazy. Um, I'm, I'm new to this whole church thing, but I've been to a lot of I've been to a lot of funerals, never seen the dead guy get up out of the casket one time. And you know what? You're right. I, I've I've been to a lot more funerals than anybody else in this room. Okay? And I've never seen the dead guy get up. I've never seen the dead lady get up. I, granted, I'll give you that. 
But we're not talking about just any dead guy, though, are we? We're talking about the unique, the appointed and anointed Son of God, Jesus the Christ. He worked miracles. He didn't just teach and preach. He worked miracles. He himself raised the dead. So why do we think this is something impossible for him to do of rising from the dead? But listen, those of you here tonight, you can, you can listen to this message about Jesus and the resurrection and you can, you can mock me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You won't be the first. It's okay. It's a dangerous position to take, but you are welcome to take it. God freely gives you the opportunity, the offer out of his tremendous love for you. He gives you the option of mocking him. Oh, but I don't recommend it, friends, because the Bible says God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked long. So watch what you say. I love you enough to give you this warning from scripture. Number two, they said, you know what? We want to hear about this some more. That's what the Athenians said there. We will hear you again about this there in verse 32, right? Um, that was just their way of saying, okay, we're done here, right? I mean, it would kind of be like, hey, Iggy, um, let's do lunch, but I really have no intention of actually meeting Iggy for lunch. It would be like, no, no, Iggy, I'll have my people call your people. We'll get together. We'll work it out. No, that's just what you say when you kind of want to wrap up the conversation. You've done, you've heard enough. It's not like you're going to mock like that first group, but you're definitely not giving in to the message. You're not biting. You're not, mm, you're not agreeing, right? You're just going, okay, we're done here, right? So that's the second thing. That was the second group of people there. Some mocked and some said, yeah, we'll talk about this later, Paul. Wink, wink. But they had no intention of ever listening to, uh, to Paul about Jesus and the resurrection again. But there was a third group there. And I don't know that it was a very big group. In fact, it says, but some men joined him and believed. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this was a smaller um, response than, than Paul's ever heard or seen or received by his preaching of the gospel. I mean, we've seen thousands come to know Christ across these pages of Acts at one time. Thousands here, thousands there, many people here, many people there. Here it just says some, and it only names two people, a man and a woman. I don't know, man. If you're here tonight and you're going, man, I need to know more about this Jesus guy. I need to know more about his resurrection that, that validates his, his message, that, that, that crowns him as the, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Then put your faith in Jesus, okay? Do what some of these Athenians did, which is put your faith in Jesus, believe in him, and have your life changed. Okay? Like, quit listening to me and start talking to the Father and say, Father, yeah, I'm a sinner. And I know I'm a sinner because my sin is always in front of me. That's what David prayed. That's what David said in the Psalms. I know I'm a sinner and I know I need your grace. So Father, save me. Jesus, save me through your death on the cross, your resurrection from the grave. Um, and friends, if there's if you pray that prayer tonight, there's no wrong words to say. There's no formula. There's no incantation. It's just you, a broken sinner, speaking to the Father in heaven who loves you more than you'll ever realize. There's no wrong way to speak to him. There's no wrong words to say. Just ask him uh, to save you and promise to live your life for him from this evening forward. And if you want to talk more about that after our service is over, after Shelly comes and puts us on the same page with some important announcements, man, it would be my pleasure and my distinct honor to pray with you, to encourage you, or to point you uh, to a place in Scripture that gives you um, some, in, some encouragement and some stability in your newfound faith. Okay? Everybody got it? Say, got it? Good. Let me pray for you.